And thanks for coming. Uh, in the interest of time, we're just going to go ahead and get started because I know all of you there at SPEC, I'm sure you have very busy schedules and um, in the interest of time, we'll get this moving along. So um, again, thank you all for coming. My name is Jamisa Stokes and I'm a materials research engineer here at NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And in cooperation with the AIAA Young Professionals Group, our Early Career Network has organized this session at AIAA SciTech on behalf of EFAR, which is the International Forum on Aviation Research. Um, EFAR aims to connect research organizations worldwide and to enable the information exchange and communication on aviation research activities and to develop an understanding on the challenges faced by the global aviation community among its members, which includes NASA. Um, but our virtual exchange series is to develop the career capabilities of researchers and employees of the EFAR member organizations and the greater aeronautics community. So in that in mind, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for this session, Dr. James Kenyon, who is the director of NASA's Advanced Air Vehicles Program within our Aeronautics Research Mission Director. He is the recipient of many professional awards. He is a fellow of AIAA, as well as a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, he has many other credits to his name, but again, in the interest of time, we'll let Dr. Kenyon take over from here. And we're looking forward to his talk about some work that NASA is doing on sustainable aviation. Um, at the end, we will be doing a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat and we'll also be giving you the opportunity to ask a question verbally if you wish to do so at the end of his talk. So with that, thank you and welcome Dr. Kate. Uh, thanks, Jamisa, and, and thank you all for, for, for participating today. Uh, hopefully some of you are, are here in San Diego, and if you are, um, I, I'm here in, in sunny San Diego. It's beautiful here, uh, which is a very funny thing. I, I left Washington, D.C., where it's been incredibly warm all week, uh, but they have a, a number of inches of snow on the ground right now, and, and the last time I heard from my, from my wife, she says it's still coming down. So uh, I think it's probably stopped by now, but not without leaving its mark behind. So uh, that seems to happen with this conference. I go out of town, it's a beautiful place, the snow dumps, and I miss all the fun and shucks, right? Um, at any rate, um, it's great to be here. It's great to talk to you all. And like I many of you are here, and if you are, if you see me wandering around, um, uh, please don't hesitate to stop me and say hello. Um, but as Jamisa said, I, I'm part of the NASA Advanced Air Vehicles Program, and, uh, and I have the pleasure of leading that team, and we're doing some really exciting things. But I want to focus in, in with, the, with the theme of the conference this year. Uh, I want to focus specifically on what we're doing at NASA in terms of sustainable aviation. Um, right now, uh, within NASA Aeronautics, we we organize, we've got a strategic implementation plan that's really our strategy overall, uh, organized around mega and thrust, but when it when you boil it all down, it comes down to four key things. Uh, one is ultra efficient transport, how we make our aircraft more efficient so they use less energy and emit less in terms of, of carbon emissions and other harmful emissions. High speed commercial flight. Our big focus here is on reducing the magnitude of the sonic boom. Uh, and the reason you would want to do that right now, there's a moratorium, as many of you are aware, on on flying supersonically over land because the boom is bad. But that's you know we know boom is loud, but 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 we've developed a theory that says maybe we can make it quiet enough to be acceptable, and we can we can develop standards around noise levels rather than speed. Uh, and so we've got a, a significant activity focused on on that, but also looking at a number of other aspects of, of, uh, commercial, of high speed commercial flight, including sustainability. Uh, another area we're looking at is advanced air mobility. Uh, think of this as on-demand uh, transportation and on-demand air mobility, um, and then even down to the personal level, but, but looking at moving people and, and goods um, ubiquitously around uh, very short places, whether that's uh, urban air taxis or, or um, remote package delivery, but all of the things that go into making that work. And of course, when you look at all of these different kinds of uh, airplanes and, and operators flying in the airspace, you need an, a, a very highly connected, highly integrated airspace that allows everybody to take part. Uh, and so working on the airspace that does that. And so that's really the four key areas where we're focused within NASA Aeronautics. 
but I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking specifically about that upper left box, the ultra efficient transport and what we're doing there to, to make aviation uh, more sustainable. Thinking about aviation, of course, we know that it impacts uh, the environment and it does so in a lot of ways, but, but the biggest thing that we think about is the combustion emissions. And this is not just carbon dioxide, but a lot of other things, particulates, NOx, um, even water vapor uh, has some impact because when it gets into the atmosphere and starts to react, this is where it really comes to play. Um, this, uh, of course, obviously we know uh, about carbon as a, as a greenhouse gas, but but even even water, uh, water vapor that comes out and, and, and forms with uh, with a particle can become um, 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 the um, contrails and the cloudiness associated with contrails is also a, a major driver of of, uh, of warming and, and, and radiative uh, heating. And so we need to make sure that we address all of these very holistically. And then we can also, there are a lot of solutions that can go out there and do some great things, but the impact at the global scale uh, that you would have, because making the other forms of energy and whatnot, we also have to think about the emissions associated with the fuel production process or the energy production process. And all of that plays into the global, the globe and the climate and, and what we need to do to, to, to do better on that front. Of course, you can't forget about noise either. Noise continues to be the largest constraint on the growth of aviation. So we've got to make sure that whatever we do uh, doesn't goof things up or mess things up in terms of noise. And actually, we continue to address and continue to reduce noise associated with aviation as well. So in terms of those impacts, of course, the world is looking at this. And, and we see a lot of different groups starting to look at as setting goals for sustainable aviation. The slide on the left is the most recent uh, official out of the ICAO that says carbon neutral from 2020. Uh, but right now the ICAO is, is working on, on, on an updated one and setting a long-term aspirational goal that's gonna look more towards zero emissions in the future. Of course, industry through the ATAG, the Air Transport Action Group, has already set a goal that says we want to be net zero by 2050. And they've, they've set some targets in terms of things like technology and operations and sustainable aviation fuels and, and maybe including some market-based measures. Within the US, we likewise have just released our, our um, Aviation Climate Action Plan, which is a whole of government look at how we can take and, and reduce economy-wide, but of course within aviation, uh, greenhouse gases to uh, a net zero by 2020. But to do that, we've got to approach it addressing and going after a number of measures very similar to what, to what the ATAG was showing. Within NASA, we look at basically three of those. We're not looking at so much at the market-based measures, although you know a great goal for us would be to say, well, we can reduce it enough to where we don't need market-based measures. Uh, but, but looking at it really by three pillars within, within our remit within NASA. One of those we'll loosely call technology. But what that really means is looking at the airplane and thinking about how we can design the airplane to fly more efficiently. Any, any amount that I can reduce the energy burn is good. And it's good from a very fundamental, absolute context. Whether you're thinking about sustainable aviation fuels, uh, a big part of sustainable aviation fuels is the scale up, getting more of them in service. Well, if I need less energy, that makes that job easier. Uh, if it's electrification or hydrogen or whatever it is, if I need less of it, that job gets easier if I make the airplane more efficient and it reduces the emissions on an absolute scale. And so that's a place where NASA has the very primary role in terms of generating or, or developing technologies in concert with industry. Uh, they can go into the design of future aircraft to make them more efficient, require less energy, and by requiring less energy mean fewer or lower emissions. Um, sustainable aviation fuels, I mentioned that though, and that's also a big part of it. And that comes into play in a couple of places. One is that we can we can develop fuels that, that actually do produce less carbon and less other harmful emissions like particulate matter and whatnot. Um, and these different cleaner forms of fuel are very good, but more to the point is that when you look at the production process, you can use that to offset some of the emissions that you don't, that you can't quite get away from, because you know if you're doing the energy, the the energy conversion on the airplane, you're you're going to have some sort of emissions associated with that. But but if I can use my production process so that on the net, uh, the global scale, I'm I'm actually doing better, 
then those sustainable aviation fuels can help and can make a huge difference. Now here, the biggest challenge is, is getting more of them. And NASA is not involved in developing new fuels or developing production paths. But what we can do, and we play a supporting role here, is we can make sure that whatever airplane combustion systems have can burn these new fuels. You bring new fuels, we can use them. You burn cleaner fuels, we can use them. And by working through the aircraft technology to make sure we can do that, we can play a key role there. We also have a lot of capability in terms of measuring the, the, the carbon emissions and characterizing the emissions. And so by supporting that or helping that out, we also can, can, can support the industry as it tries to go into the scale up. And then the third area where we play a role is in operations. Um, basically, the idea is to be able to make the airspace system more efficient so that the airplanes take off and land in a way that is more efficient uh, and less harmful, you know, things like avoiding contrails and whatnot. And so, so looking at the operations, we've, we've been engaged in developing the technologies that are part of the airspace system, the airspace traffic management system today. We're going to a new system that we've called NextGen for a number of years, and a lot of that is based on technologies that, that, that NASA has developed working with our partners at the FAA. And we continue to see that going forward and developing the technology that will allow us to do that. And I'm gonna talk in more detail about the work that we're doing in each one of these as I, as I go forward here. But I'm gonna start with the, with the technology. We've been working on this, this is not new. We've been working on technologies for a while and, and going back even as far as 2008 timeframe, we started doing these system studies and we called them the generational N plus one, N plus two, N plus three, where N was then, and then looking out at future generations and what they could look like. And that has spun into technology development activities for the last decade or more um, that we've been able to advance through projects such as our prior environmentally responsible aviation project. Uh, we did an advanced composites project where we were able to reduce the length of time it takes to get from composites from concept to certification. And we've also developed, a, continued a number of studies and developed technologies, including things like electrified propulsion, transonic truss brace wing, very high aspect ratio wings. And, and through all of that, we've been able to mature and understand these in such a way that, that we've identified four key technologies. And I'll talk about those in just a minute, but these four key technologies are sort of the best of breed coming out of this decade of progress that we've been able to make. And so those four key technologies uh, really come down to, to, to ultra efficient wings, looking at very high aspect ratio wings, the, the most iconic being the transonic truss brace wing. And that's kind of what this, this big picture here shows, but you can also see uh, a, a scale model in a wind tunnel. Um, looking at small core, uh, high thermal efficiency uh, gas turbine uh, technologies, um, electrified aircraft propulsion. And, and on a large scale, if you start thinking about subsonic transports like single aisle type of transports, you're talking about using this to go into more of a, a, a hybrid configuration. But if you get down to smaller scales, maybe it's fully electric, but electrified propulsion. And then composites. Uh, but the challenge is getting them, if you really want to, we know about composites, but if you really want to do something, being able to penetrate the market by getting your production rates up to, to, to higher manufacturing rates that can actually do that. And so with these four key technologies, uh, we're really looking in the in the next generation, starting maybe in the 2030s, being able to get these technologies into future transports to dramatically improve uh, the efficiency and dramatically reduce the fuel burn on the order of 20, 20 to 30 percent uh, for future transports. So, of course, double checking ourselves, are we doing all that we can do? Well, again, we said we're doing the best in breed. But, but what's the standard we use? Well, we use, everybody knows the phrase range equation. And, and here, and this is just, you know, there are lots of forms of it, but this is a fully integrated out form that's kind of just um, almost algebraic in nature. Um, you look at it and you say, well, well what are the, the, the terms? Well, there are three key terms. And one is the aerodynamic efficiency. And so we're going after that with the transonic truss brace wing. There's a the propulsion efficiency. We're going after that with the small core gas turbine. Uh, there's weight. Um, we're going after that with the composites. Um, but then but then electrification gets a little bit interesting because you can use that in a lot of different ways. Uh, if I can optimize my my engine cycle with maybe a, 
a, a topping cycle, a top of a climb or something, maybe I can make my engine smaller. Well, that's lighter weight, right? Or it integrates better for less drag, better aerodynamic efficiency. But I can also optimize my propulsion system a little bit better. So it's actually kind of an interesting one because it doesn't fit cleanly. It can actually help all three. But you also look at this in the big picture and you say, can do something on each of these fronts. There's no one way I can just pick one of these and run with it and, and get the best I can get. But if I look at all of these together, uh, I can really make a, an impact. And so that's what we're trying to do here uh, with it in NASA. So just talking a little bit about it. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Well, when you look at aerodynamic efficiency, what it really comes down to is, is trying to increase your span while reducing your wetted area. And so what that leads you to is these very, very long, very, very slender wings. And we've looked at a couple of different instantiations of that. But again, the, 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 the biggest player there is if I can maximize that, then I get these very long slender wings, but they're aerodynamically or aeroelastically probably not quite what I want in terms of the aeroelastic stability. And so we offset that by using a truss. Uh, and so, of course, we've been doing strut braced wings. If uh, I, I, I got my pilot's license in a Cessna 172, um, that's not a newer airframe by any stretch of the imagination. It's also tonic. Uh, so we, we understand these, but when you take it up to be transonic and you, you go to these very high, very large wings, very thin wing design, it makes it a little more sporty. And so we're launched, we've launched an activity. We've actually been working on this technology for a number of years, uh, but, but we're looking at something in the Mach 0.8 uh, sort of a flight regime. Uh, we've demonstrated that we can get that and that we can get very good efficiency. But now the question becomes, when I start trying to take into account real world effects like Buffett and Stahl, trying to put a high lift system in there, uh, what happens to my, to my efficiency or at least my uncertainty around that efficiency number that I'm putting there. And so what we're gonna be looking at over the next uh, several years is being able to address each of the different uh, aspects of, of, of a more realistic flight system. And then the top left photo here is one, you know, that we worked on just this past year. Uh, we installed uh, high lift devices on a, on, a, um, on, a, on a wind tunnel model. And, and, and tested it in the wind tunnel in, in various configurations or flight configurations associated with approach, including going into ground effect um, uh, for, the, for the flare. And so um, we get a lot of learning and we got a lot of learning about, about what would happen in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, the high lift integration and what that would do to that performance. And so uh, a lot of work to be done, but, but interesting things to try to push this along to say, can we make this technology real? looking though and, and 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 a big thing that we're launching this year is something we're calling our sustainable flight demonstrator because of course when you start getting into uh into the the aero configurations and the structures that you really need to go to flight uh, if you really want to prove out the technology and get it to a technology readiness level that industry can introduce into future products and, and of course, the transonic truss brace wing will be a contender in this, but, but we're opening up the design space to, to various configurations that will allow us to look at this very high aerodynamic efficiency uh, associated with, with high aspect ratios or, or lifting bodies or whatever it takes, but allow you to really shake this out and, and, and see what the future could look like here and getting it into flight. So we're launching this this year. And uh, we're expecting to have a competition within uh, within our industry here later on in the year to to identify the technologies that they would take forward into a flight demonstrator. So we talked a little bit about uh, engine efficiency. Of course, engine efficiency consists of a couple of different parts. Uh, one is the propulsive and transfer efficiency, and you see uh, the very very large fans that have come out on the recent products, the the Leap engine and the gear turbo fan particularly. Uh, and the transfer efficiency that comes with the low pressure turbine and how that, that drives that fan. And so uh, a lot of work there. It's really about getting the fan pressure ratio down. And it helps you in a lot of ways. It reduces your noise, but improves your fuel burn dramatically. We've made a lot of progress there, but now we want to look at the engine core, the thermal efficiency, uh, being able to drive the overall pressure ratio up, drive the core size down while maintaining the power levels you need to drive 
uh, a fan large enough for, for a single aisle type of an airplane. And so uh, working very hard on this, and we just launched a new project that will be working on this, and I'll talk about that here. Our hybrid thermally efficient core is looking to do a 5 to 10% fuel burn reduction against the 2020 best in class. And that essentially is the, is the leap in the Dura turbo fan. Uh, but do it without, while making the core size a lot smaller. Of course, that helps you in terms of your uh, overall uh, engine architecture as well. You can make your bypass ratio larger without making your engine any bigger. So you could still get it into a single aisle class. But we want to do that while driving the thermal efficiency up. Uh, making those component efficiencies good, pushing your overall pressure ratio up, but making that core. And, and if you know anything about gas turbine engines, you know that's a really hard problem. The other thing, though, that we're doing with this project is we're looking at taking larger and larger amounts of electrical power off. Of course, um, these are great generators, and this is where we get a lot of our electrical power for today's airplanes, but we want a lot more. We want enough to be able to put into hybrid architectures. And so looking at how we can do that without um, messing up the, the efficiency or the operability of the gas turbine with this very small core, very high efficiency core, it's a challenging problem. But we just launched a new activity called the high tech or the hybrid thermally efficient core project to do that. We just awarded technology uh, contracts with, uh, with our industry, and they're often working on these. They'll down select the best of breed technologies and take those to core demonstrators later on uh, in, in this decade as well. Of course, if we're going to do uh, hybrid systems, though, we've got to work on electrified uh, propulsion technologies. And so we also have a technology activity uh, where we're working on that. Um, here we're looking at a couple of things. First off, think of it in two parts. One is the architecture. This is how you tie and integrate everything together. And that's going to really depend on, on your overall system, your airplane that you're developing, what its needs are. But we need architectures that allow us to go in and, and build these things and put them together. This is really going to be based on your controls, but then tying all the components together. And then you've got to worry about the components. And can the components give you the, the real challenge here is, is power and energy density, being able to get the right power levels. Uh, but but doing so in a way that is is small enough in terms of space, you can fit on an airplane and light enough that you can pick it up and carry it on an airplane. And so some real challenges there, uh, but have been a lot of great work. One of the things we've done within NASA is we've developed a new ground-based test capability that we call the NASA Electric Aircraft Test Bed or NEAT facility uh, near uh, NASA Glenn. It's actually at uh, our Armstrong test facility, which is a, a, a test site associated or affiliated with NASA Glenn up in the Cleveland, Ohio area. Um, and, and it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a great capability. We can do multi megawatts uh, of power. Uh, we have the space to lay out the architectures and to tie all the components together. And we also have an altitude chamber where we can take components to altitude and get those conditions because you get into things like passion's law and arcing and the, the breakdown voltage and the arcing that, that comes with some of these high power systems. So you can look at installation materials and how you put things together and integrate and, and join things. So you can do a lot of interesting things to really test out these high power architectures. And that becomes important because the integration part is key to the electrified propulsion system. And so another activity we have within NASA as an electrified powertrain flight demonstration. So one of the things we can do on the ground is we can be very flexible with our architectures. But once you start to put it in the air, now you gotta pick your architecture and run with it and, and, take, that to, and, and take that to flight. And so uh, by doing these projects, we can, we can do both ends of that spectrum. We can look at the various architectures on the ground, but then we were also have launched a project and, and, and made contract awards in September uh, with uh, with two companies, with GE Aviation and with a company called Magniex, to look at taking these to flight. Uh, they they've got aircraft that they selected to to do this, and they're looking at those architectures, and we'll be doing that design uh, and development and test with us um, with their aircraft, and that will really push the technology and maturity of this up uh, quite a bit to show that we will learn a lot from being able to integrate these high power systems. And by the way, then whatever we learn, we feed back into what we're doing on the ground so that we can continue to develop future architectures as well. And then finally, we get to the, the structural efficiency, being able to make things lighter weight while having the strength. 
And a great example, and you can kind of see the, 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 the graphic here on the left that shows, you know, by year how we've been able to, to advance where you get higher and higher percentages by weight. Now, of course, the composites are lightweight, so a high percentage by weight is disproportionately large in terms of, I, I like to call it real estate, but the actual physical layout of the airplane. And so the bottom graphic there shows you on a 787 just how much of that uh, has gone and, and, and become composites. But our challenge here is that, you know, these wide body aircraft like the 787, uh, the A350, the A220 is not a wide body, but it also in the MC21, the production rates are relatively low. Um, but when you look at, well, where's the market that we really want to penetrate? Where are we getting so much of our missions? Where are we selling so many more airplanes? That's the A320 and the 737 single, single aisle class of an aircraft. And to get there, we need to get our manufacturing rates up from more on the order of 14 or 15 a month to more like 60 a month or industries has, has expressed visions that are much higher than that. But you want to be able to do that without plastering states with, with these great big production facilities, because of course you can produce more by just building a whole bunch more factory space, but the, the cost associated with that is prohibitive. That's not exactly helping yourself from a sustainability perspective either. And so what we want to be able to do is our manufacturing rates up so that we can do this without a uh, significantly higher footprint without significantly higher costs, without significantly higher impact. And so that really comes down to technologies that allow us to improve uh, that rate uh, from, from layup to cure, to assembly, to inspections, you, you name it. And so we launched a new project or we're launching a new project actually, uh, it should be formally launched here in about two weeks called the High Rate Composite Aircraft Manufacturing or HICAM project. And the goal is to increase the production rate capability by a factor of four to six X without taking a huge cost or a weight penalty. And so looking at choosing the right material system for what you're trying to do and developing the materials and manufacturing processes around that so that you can get these manufacturing rates up and doing that using things like um, um, uh, automated fiber uh, placement but being able to get really good process control in there and then also marrying that with automated uh, non-destructive evaluation techniques and looking at how we can increase the, 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 the rates of that uh, while maintaining the quality. And so the goal here is to is to do that, to be able to go into a, a large manufacturing demonstration of a, of a large, uh, either a fuselage structure or a wing panel, but a very large composite uh, structure and then and then testing it to say well did we get what we what we thought we were going to get and so uh, we're launching that project uh, later on this month quite frankly it's been in formulation now for a little while it's going through requirements development and getting ready to go and, and launch so a lot of really great work and our target here is to bring all of this work together again those four key technologies dynamics um, uh, weight uh, propulsion of efficiency and then electrification, which cuts across all of them and, and do these individual technology development activities so that we can get to major demonstrations that, that, that demonstrate the maturity of the technology. They're learning that we need and burning down the risk so that industry can include that in their decision space for the next generation of aircraft that would likely make entry into service sometime in the 2030s. And so we have all of these activities launched or launching in the last year, the early part of this year, so that we can get those technology activities done. Of course, we're doing all of those as individual activities as well, but then we're, we wanna be able to demonstrate and show that, that we're bringing this together. And so we're also launching an activity for a model-based systems analysis, systems engineering sort of a framework that allows us to integrate this within the government, but also working with industry partners to see the interactional effects see how these all come together in an integrated fashion, which also will help us to reduce risk for future designs and future for future products. So on top of the technology piece, now let's switch to a different pillar, that of sustainable aviation fuels. Um, we also, again, play a supporting role here, but, but this is a place where we just completed some, some very exciting work, uh, working uh, with the Boeing company uh, and their eco demonstrator. Uh, we were able to to test various blend ratios from, from no to a little bit to 50% and then all the way up to 
of sustainable aviation fuels and, and kind of parametrically look at, at the emissions that are coming off of that. And so we were able to set up and, and our sniffing, what we call it sniffing capability uh, behind the engine and a, and, a, and a leap engine burning up to 100% sustainable fuels. And so we went, we took the samples. Uh, I, I would love to tell you about the results right now, but we've got gobs of data and we're still going through it. We just took this, uh, did this testing in October. Uh, but the, res the early results are very, very promising, but we've got a long way to go before we're going to be able to publish those and put those out. We will. Uh, but based on that, we're looking at, at, at future opportunities to, to, to test, as, as including going to flight and being able to test in flight, um, working um, not only here within the United States, but, but also talking to, to international partners uh, through EFAR, uh, some of our EFAR partners on that as well. So just some exciting work going on in sustainable aviation fuels. And then we talked also about operations, um, and uh, and we've been working on on tools uh, with our partners in the FAA through a series of what we call airspace technology demonstrations or ATDs. Uh, but we we demonstrated integrated arrival, departure, and surface operations was one of the big ones we did here, where we were actually able to go and deploy this on a limited limited basis basis at the Charlotte Douglas International Airport uh, near Charlotte, North Carolina, here in the United States. Um, we deployed that and you can see the dates there. We first put it out there in September and we, we've continued to update this. Uh, but, but based on this, we've been able to save a fair amount of fuel. Um, but the real, the real thing here, when you look at the global scale, it's kind of a drop in the bucket. But, but looking at that graphic on the right hand side, if we can scale this up across, we can make a huge impact. And what's great about this is the technology is deployable now. And so looking ahead, uh, we have a, a, a vision for making our operations sustainable across the board by doing integrated trajectory planning, starting from and it's, it's gate to gate. Uh, the great thing with that last one is that, you know, you didn't push back from the gate until you had your place up there figured out and you would basically push off the gate and taxi out and go straight up and take off and take your place in the order. So you could plan ahead, less runtime on the ground, less idle time, less taxi time. But think about doing that with your entire trajectory and you can optimize it for for multiple things you can optimize it for fuel burn you can optimize it to make sure that you don't mess up anything with neighborhood noise you can optimize for contrails if you can figure out where the contrails are but what what's required here is being able to get the data uh, being being driven by knowledge being driven by data so having flight deck capabilities to look at all the data that you need to do to do this multivariate optimization and, and, and minimize um, climate impact, whatever that means for the flight that you're on. And so, uh, and, and by the way, do all of that and do it safely at the same time. So there's a lot that goes into that, but it's something that, that we can do relatively quickly uh, because of the scale of being able to get the information and the data onto the aircraft it goes at a much faster pace than some other things. So when you put all of that together, we call that our Sustainable Flight National Partnership. And it's a partnership for multiple reasons. It's a partnership because we're working with our industry partners, uh, whether that's the airframers, uh, composite uh, suppliers, uh, the engine companies, there are, there's a huge industry out there that does all of this together. And, and even if you know it's a, uh, an American, a US made engine flying on a European airplane, we're making the world better. And so it's truly a partnership um, when you look at this big picture. Uh, and so working with our industry, working with other government agencies, the FAA is a, is a huge partner in this. They, they work on a lot of near term technologies, but they're also partnered with us on our projects. They're partnered with us on the airspace work and they're, they're one of the key leaders uh, on the on sustainable aviation fuels, but that brings in other government partners with the departments of energy and the departments of Agri department of agriculture uh, that are leading the charge on sustainable aviation fuels. And of course, uh, again, we have partnerships through EFAR on on some of this work as well. And so, uh, it really is a sustainable flight uh, national partnership that brings about benefits. Looking at all the aircraft technologies, as well as the sustainable aviation fuels and the trajectory optimization uh, for airspace operations. But of course, that's kind of the near term. So what do we want to do about the far term? Is that going to get us to zero? Well, you know, theoretically, when we get the sustainable aviation fuels up, it, it should. 
But we really think that if we want to look for zero, we're going to have to think even harder. And so one of the other things that we're working on is a long-term technology and innovation strategy uh, that's really focused on thinking outside of the box. Um, and, and, and again, I, I mentioned earlier, we had done a, a series of studies in the 2008, 2009 timeframe, N plus one, N plus two, N plus three. Well, what we're doing right now is the N plus three. Um, that's our sustainable flight national partnership. So that, and so one of the things we're looking at is, is launching a number of concept studies and technology development that we're going to need to hit that 2040s and beyond impact. And so, um, Within, within my program, we're ramping up uh, to launch some studies uh, later on this year, uh, working with, with the industry to define what are those out there concepts. You know, Back in 2008 and 2009, blended wing bodies and hybrid wing bodies and transonic truss brace wing were pretty radical ideas. And now those are things we're looking at seriously. So what are gonna be those ra radical ideas that we think of that maybe by the 2040s, 2030s, 2040s, we're looking at seriously? Uh, we're also working through our university leadership initiative uh, within the Transformative Aeronautics Concepts Program at NASA, uh, tapping into university innovation to think outside of the box, looking at alternative energy sources, uh, different ways of, of, of building airplanes and doing all of that together. And, and again, looking for out, out of the box thinking, genuine innovation focused on, on, on net zero emissions concepts. And so we'll be bringing that forward uh, as part of um, re revitalizing and regenerating our portfolio as we start to mature some of these key technologies, looking at that next generation. And so kind of to wrap up, um, of course, there are significant challenges to, to sustainable growth. Um, there is no silver bullet. There is no one technology that we're going to find that's going to make it all better. Uh, and so we've got to work across in terms of developing better technologies to make aircraft more efficient, looking at sustainable aviation fuels, looking at things like electrification, different energy sources, and looking at also how we operate and how we can, how we can make the operations themselves more efficient. And so we're looking at that. And right now, our Sustainable Flight National Partnership is looking for applications in the 2030s, developing and maturing technologies so we can hit the market and begin to make an impact as soon as possible. But then also thinking out, out of the box, what is that far future going to look like so that we can genuinely get to get to a future of zero emissions or, or at the very least zero impact to our climate and our world. And so with that, I thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I'm very, very much looking forward uh, to taking your questions. So Jamisa, I'll hand it back back to you. Thank you so much for this talk. It was very informative. We have a few questions in the chat. And um, again, just like Alina posted in the chat, if there's anything that you want to ask um, directly, we'll be unmuting people in a second. So if you would like to verbally ask your question, um, please use the raise your hand function and then we can bring you in to ask our speaker question. But um, the first question that's in the chat actually, and it's sort of answered this, but um, you sort of answered this in one of your slides, but just to have just a general timeline, especially those of us in research who are working on a very low technology readiness level, I think this question would be very good for us. So. It says, how do you feel the technologies perform, will perform in the market after NASA has advanced the technologies? Will the manufacturers adopt them and the regulators approve them? What is the timeline for a regular person to see these technologies, for example, on a flight from D.C. to sunny San Diego? <laughs> that, that's a great question. And, and that's one of the things that's a little bit different about what, what we're doing now. Um, NASA historically has has been focused a lot on very fundamental technologies, um, but but what we're seeing in our and the Sustainable Flight National Partnership is taking the technologies that we've been working on for this last since the 2008 2009 timeframe, uh, and and taking the best of breed those that have developed, those that have matured, and those that have continued to prove over and over again that they could actually make an impact. And, and so what we're trying to do now is take those and actually mature those, burn down the risk. And, and that technology readiness level of six is a very meaningful marker. What does that mean? That means that it's, this is beyond a concept. 
uh, and this is beyond laboratory experiment. I've actually taken and I've demonstrated the technology in a relevant environment and it's at a system or subsystem level, which means I've gotten the boundary conditions pretty much right. And then I've taken it out and I put it in the environment that it needs to perform in and it's done well. And the reason you want to do that is because that way there's not these things that you miss with this assumption or with that simplification, you've actually put it out there and it's done pretty well. Now, of course, you also have to dissociate yourself from the widget itself and think more about the design space. We've proven that we can design in that design space a technology consisting of these things and that the physics work. You may still need to make trades when you get into making it a product. You may still need to take a little bit of a hit there or a little bit of a hit there, but you've fundamentally demonstrated that the physics work. And so that's where we're focused right now is taking these technologies to a high technology readiness level, actually demonstrating them in a way so that you can say it works at the system, it works at the right boundary conditions, and it works in the right environment uh, subject to the right stressor so that the, I can say with some degree of uh, confidence that it works. And what we want to do is by demonstrating at that level, then you burn down risk. Industry can only lean so far forward in the risk before their board's going to say, no, we're not going to pay for that. And so you have to burn down the risk to a certain level. And that technology readiness level six is key to that. And so, so that's a great question. The goal here is to demonstrate the technologies sometime in the mid to late 2020s. And that could get you into a product development cycle that would hit the market sometime in the 2030s. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, the idea, the general idea is the single aisle market is, is, is going to be right for the next generation around then. And is that going to look like something we have today or is that going to look like something fundamentally different? And, and we're hoping by taking on some of this risk and working with industry to burn this risk down that we can push them forward so that we can get a better benefit in terms of the overall sustainability uh, by, by, by higher percentage point fuel burn reduction, by, uh, by leaning forward and just taking, taking a little bit more risk and, and, and putting a little bit more technology in. That makes a lot of sense. And I personally had a follow-up to that, like when you mentioning trying to leave the amount of risk to the companies wanting to adopt this technology um, do you believe that the sustainability and the efficiency benefits are enough for them to overcome potential costs of adopting said technology? Well, and, and, and that, that's, that's a great question, and I'll answer that in two parts. Um, one, one is, I think if we, can, if we as a government can work with them to take on some of that risk, um, that helps a lot. Um, the, the, the trick is to make... To, if, if we can reduce the operating costs far enough, then the customers, the ultimate customers who are the airlines and the operators who, and of course the ultimate customers are the passengers, but if the airlines can offer flights, the passengers can afford to fly, right? Um, that means that the airlines have to have their operating costs. And so reducing energy, energy is a cost center to an operator. And so if we can reduce that energy enough, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, price of fuel goes into that. Regulatory regime goes into that. But right now we're seeing a lot more push for regulations that are going to more and more limit um, carbon. And so that's a big push. Uh, fuel prices are pretty high right now. And that's that's a big push. Is it going to stay that way? Well, we never know. But, but it, they certainly uh, aren't where they were in 2005. Let me just put it that way. They went up in 2006 and they came down a lot, but they didn't come all the way down. Um, so they're going to, you know, um, this, this helps. And by, by reducing that fuel burn, it makes it a better product that, that the, the manufacturers can sell more readily. Um, of course, there's a cost to doing that, but it, but that cost, the big cost comes in the risk. And if we can help burn down that risk, then that, then that helps. At the end of the day, it still has to buy its way on. And it is possible that any one or two of these technologies will just not work. And, and, and okay, I'd rather learn it here than in a product development cycle, uh, but we can still make an impact. And then we can save industry and, and, and the world a lot of time and money, including NASA, a lot of time and money if we prove something doesn't work. 
if we figure it out early and stop. But but that's the nature of, and that's why we do this is because if we knew it was going to work, we wouldn't need to do it. But but we also know that we need to be able to lean into and take some of that risk. But that's that's the point of what we're trying to accomplish is to take on some of that risk and do some of that learning so that industry can take off and run with it. That makes sense. Thank you so much for that follow up answer. Um, there is another question from the chat, which says, are those technologies under development with cooperation with the industry from the beginning or NASA starts with the vision and then the industry joins in later? I would say it's a mix. Um, I, I would say it's a mix. Uh, we have brilliant researchers um, and, you know, Jamisa is one of our brilliant researchers, but we have brilliant researchers in NASA. Uh, NASA, and, and, and I'll tell you, I was working in industry when NASA started pushing on electrification and not everybody was aligned with the NASA vision on electrification, uh, but NASA pushed on it and it pushed industry to think bigger and, and it really made an impact. Now, uh, NASA listened when industry pushed back uh, because maybe we, we were leaning forward a little further than we should. And that was a good interplay that helped us to get to a good place where I think we pushed industry, industry pushed us. Um, industry comes in with ideas and we scratch our heads and say, well, could that work? Um, we have ideas and we talk to industry about it. And, and, and so it comes from both points. And, and the idea though is, is having that intellectual conversation that allows us to push each other um, is really what, what, what gets us to a good place. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so I think we were, I thought someone might have unmuted to ask a question. Um, that's totally okay, no need to be shy if anyone wants to verbally uh, ask a question to keep this conversation going. But um, I, like I, will ask, <laughs> um, I will ask something that um, came to my mind is, um, I recently took a class about um, electric aircraft and urban air mobility. And I wanted to know, where do you think that market is headed within the next few years? Well, that, that one's gonna be, it's a funny thing. I was, I was talking to some, some other folks at NASA about that earlier too. Um, this, is, this is one of those things where there's, there's a vision and this is a place where maybe it's even higher risk because it's not an existing market, at least not on a large scale today. Um, and, and if we can open up new markets, uh, that's another key role that we have in NASA is being able to think about and open those new markets because it's very hard, again, for industry to lean in and take a risk sometimes. Uh, and in this particular case, there's, there's actually quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of industry investment in taking risks. But if we're ever going to scale up and, and see that, we also need to be involved to make sure that the scale up works. Um, and so um, where are we, but, but, but your question is, where, where do we see that going? And, and, and I would say um, there are some, some very interesting potential applications. You know, the, the most obvious is the urban air mobility, the, the urban air taxi. Um, if you've ever tried to get to the airport in New York, uh, you know that that can be uh, a little bit of a bear trying to get across the East River there. Um, there's actually not, there's not a, uh, a subway service to LaGuardia. Just saying. Um, so that that can be interesting, uh, but uh, but but that's a an application where we actually see some of the earlier applications are things that we're already kind of pushing on. Uh, we know that drones are delivering packages, just make that a lot bigger, and you're you're right in the same sort of a. Um, uh, there are aeromedical uh, sorts of things. We we do. Um, you see the helicopters the, with the care flights, but but what if what if I need to get a more frequent interaction going, and it doesn't necessarily have to involve um, carrying people, but it could. And one of the one of the very interesting things that, that we've had suggested, uh, well, what if we take the doctors to the patients instead of the patients to the doctors? That that could be a real game changer. The the fact is, until we actually start exercising some of these. Um, that's where the innovation is going to play in. But to do that, we do have to have some capability out there. Um, we need to understand the reliability of the electric propulsion system. Um, you use a lot of off-the-shelf electric motors and stuff, uh, but we're using them at duty cycles and power levels and in ways that they weren't necessarily designed for. And so understanding 
what that's going to do with those kinds of duty cycles. And, and then, you know, we're going to identify some things that don't quite work in an aviation, especially when you're carrying people sort of a sense. But that's where the technology and innovation comes in and where we can make a, a big difference pretty quickly. And, uh, and our, we have a project called the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project that's working on that. And what they're seeing and what they think they'll be able to accomplish is pretty amazing um, in terms of reliability improvements. And, and of course, that'll help out this market, but it could also help out a lot of other markets that use electric motors too. And so there are spinoff effects. Um, noise is gonna be one. These don't sound quite like helicopters. And so, you know, but understanding, you know, how irritating that's going to be or not, um, we'll find out, uh, right? I, I was at a, um, a, well, unfortunately a friend of mine uh, passed, but he was a little league umpire and they had a, uh, a memorial service out on a little league field and somebody decided to fly the drone with the little camera above the, the memorial service to kind of tape it. And I got to tell you, we're sitting here trying to listen to people talk and things. That thing irritated the stew out of me. But if, if there's a way, but, but okay, so now scale up, make it big enough to actually carry people. Um, we got to think about those sorts of things. I'm sure there are ways we can make it work, but we have to have data. We have to have knowledge to do that. And so uh, um, I, I think there's potentially a future there anytime about a future that's something different from what we have um you know there's a little bit of speculation but i think the more we know and the more we learn and the safer we can make them and the better we can understand the noise the better we'll figure out how to use them and i think once we get them out there and have people using them um, people will get pretty creative and we may see some tremendous growth Thanks so much. So we have the, we've unmuted everyone. And so we have about nine minutes left. Um, does anyone have any further questions for Dr. Kenyon today? You guys are gonna let me off the hook. I can't believe that. <laughs> we had a couple, but you know, it might be a shy crowd and that's okay. <laughs> Well, we'll give you about eight minutes of your time back. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenyon, for coming to talk to us about all the wonderful things that NASA is doing with sustainable aviation. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this talk was recorded and we'll have it available to the attendees um, at some point um, next week. But if there's no further questions, then yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kenyon, for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you, Jamisa. Thank you all for the kind invitation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and like I say, um, you know, none of you have your cameras on, so I can't see what any of you look like. But, but if you see me around, um, don't hesitate to stop. Uh, stop me, introduce uh, yourself to me if you want to follow up a question or you just want to chat for a little while. I think that would be fantastic. So um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. And again, Jamisa and Alina, thank you so much for facilitating this and for, for inviting me to participate. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>